Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release. Will all the developers please stop making video games? It would help me out a lot. We got a great show tonight, especially if you love video games that start with the word star. We last left off with Star Warrior for the Atari home computer, and let's see what our next game is. Yes, we knew it was going to, we had to have some game that started with Star Wars, right? So this is 1981, at some point in 1981, this is Star Wars for the Commodore VIC-20. We don't have a lot of info for this one, no box, just a few screenshots, but for other versions, we have one by Adcom Electronics, which had no joystick control, and then another one by UMI, and that's the one we're going to be playing. Let's pop in and play Star Wars for the Commodore VIC-20, released at some point in 1981. There it is. Unlicensed Star Wars, but we heard the music for the very first time. That's the first time we've ever heard Star Wars ever on the on the channel. We've seen lots of rip-off Star Wars games, and we're in the game now. So the way this works, we've seen this on the Commodore Pet, and then I believe one other time on another home computer, uh, maybe the Exidy Sorcerer. But the idea is it's a space combat game from a first-person perspective. You um, fly around and destroy the TIE Fighters. You can see I'm sh shooting my laser off, and it looks like they just loop around. So not technically impressive, not trying to go for some realism or simulation, but the idea is you're flying around in space shooting the enemies. If I can get over there, it looks like it's not allowing me to... Come on, go over to the side. <laughs> it, I would say that even though I'm using the Com Commodore VIC-20 joystick, the controls aren't as smooth as the Commodore PET. And that's because we were using keyboard controls. Maybe I should just resort to keyboard here. Let's see if that works. Can I go over even better? No, it's still about the same. <laughs> it ended the game. Your rank is Space Cadet. You want to play again? Yes, we do. Yeah, so you, you, the, there's really not anything super technical that's going on. It is very much an arcade game. The first person perspective is though fun. The intro music was awesome. We've had a handful of other Commodore VIC-20 games play some music for us, but hearing the Star Wars theme for the first time was pretty awesome, <laughs> right? I mean, that sounded just like Star Wars, and I know this is not a license. George Lucas must be very angry right now. All right, so that was Star Wars for the Commodore VIC-20, and that's pretty much it. Uh, you, have, you have fun flying around, shooting things in the air. For all the games we played at the, this point, it's um, it's actually really fun to play a game from a first-person perspective and a novelty in 1981, but the way that it plays and the simplicity of it, you can tell that it was uh, kind of rushed to, to, be, to be put out. So I'm going to still say it's about uh, below average, two and a half stars, considering every other game we've seen up to this point. All right, so after Star Wars, let's see what our next game is. From one micro to another, this is the ZX81, and this is Starfighter. This is part of a compilation called Games Tape 2, and we've already seen Pyramid that we checked out, and this is Starfighter, part of the compilation. Starfighter is fighting at the edge of the universe with stars going nova all around you. The enemy are trying to destroy your civilization. Will you let them? They will come at you from all sides, center them in your gun sight, and blast away. Almost sounds like it's the same concept as Star Wars. We just played on the Commodore, uh, the, the VIC-20. So the keys, 1 through 8, move your gun sight. 1 and 4 are diagonals, and 0 fires, fires your laser. So just bear that in mind. All the controls are coming from the numbers only. And I believe that's it. Yeah, just a screenshot. We have other versions, but it's just an alternate version. All right, so as we always do on the ZX81, you get a cassette tape, you plug it into the ZX81, and you play. So this is 1981, and th this is Starfighter. Here we go. All right, so you can see on the keyboard, the ZX81 has all the numbers at the top. So the top row of the numbers, to get the game to go, we go to run, and then new line, and we are in. And it even explains the controls here. You're fighting at the end of the universe with stars going nova. Okay, so it's the same that they displayed on the cassette Leaflet. Keys 1 through 8 fire your laser sight. 0 fires your laser. Now this would make more sense if it had a keypad. You know, the, like the number pad. But it doesn't. It's using the top row. So just bear that in mind when you think of if you're going to sit down and play this game in 1981. Looks like H is TIE Fighter. X is X-Wing. O is Battlestar. Oh, okay. Yeah, we've seen a lot of ZX81 games that you're using ASCII characters. So uh, 20 or more hits give a replay, hit any key to start. And I just saw in the chat, um, yeah, that was, uh, I, I, I do not know for sure if it was in basic or not. All right, so any key to go? 
Let's go. <laughs> I'm very curious to see how this plays out. Okay, so the way this is controlling, okay, I can move left and right, and I'm holding down the key on the keyboard. When I want to fire, I hit zero on the keyboard. Zero? Where's my zero? It's not, maybe it's still drawing it in? Oh, there we go. That's my fire. So I just fired. If you missed it, you probably blinked because me firing the shot is just that flash in the center, and that was it. And then if I want to go into the TIE Fighter, got to get my way up to the X or to the H. And wait for them to get in the sights. Waiting and go. Oh, and we got them. So we blew them up. So TIE Fighter has been blown up. And you can see at the top screen, it shows our energy. Wasn't expecting sound. We haven't seen too much on the ZX81 anyway. So what you see here is the game. Th this is it. We're playing Starfighter, which is part of a compilation. And the controls would be okay if they weren't using that top row for the numbers. Because you have to work out, I'm going to pull up the keypad again, you have to work out which ones, it's not using the cursor keys, just so you know, you have to work out, see, one, two, three, and four for the diagonals. Right now, I'm just using the easy ones because I know the cursor keys. But that's how you would have to control the reticle that you see on the screen. When we played it on uh, the Star Wars game on the Commodore VIC-20, that's using the VIC-20 joystick. And this one, that's rough. Going from one game that has a joystick to this using the keypad. Or not the keypad, the, the, the keyboard controls. And we're playing on one of those uh, membrane keyboards. It's um, it's a little scary to think of controlling that in 1981. But there you go. Quaint, fun. Starfighter is part of a compilation, but we're breaking them apart. So, And we're obviously not going to do artist. But for Pyramid and Starfighter, they're going to be their own rating. For everything we've seen up to this point, Starfighter really is not good. Uh, it's in the bad range. I'm going to say two stars... Maybe to be generous, but I'll go one and a half because of the controls. Playing on a top row number keyboard is very rough, especially even for 1981. And on this uh, system, it is even rougher. All right, so that was Starfighter. Let's see where we're going. So we're in Europe now. Where are we headed next? Next, let's head to the Apple II and play some Star Mines. Let's take a look at the artwork first. So the front of the box for Star Mines, this is by Steve Baker. Way to go, Steve. Published, uh, at least says something about soft tape, but look at the artwork. Some of the best we've seen for a home computer game. The box covers are usually either homebrew, they're made, made themselves, but this is this is top tier. This is really good. I'm impressed. And <laughs> that's the five and a quarter floppy disk. Really funny. They must have been uh, loving the front of the box because they just pretty much just pasted it onto the, the, the disk. And that's all we got for artwork. So kind of hard to come by. Here's Star Mines for the Apple II, released at some point in 1981. I'm excited to check this one out. Welcome, Casey Club Kirby. We are still, at some point in 1981, playing all the video games in alphabetical order. We're closing out 1981 eventually, but by the time we're done, it's going to be a, around 600 games for just 1981. Oh, there you go. Love it. That got the slow crawl. It is soft tape. Probably presents Star Mines by Steve A. Baker. I really enjoy this. If you if you like the arcade, the home computer, when you play a game on the home computer, they want you to feel like you're in the arcade and they're getting close. It's awesome seeing this battle of the arcade push itself through uh, higher technology and better graphics and sound. And then we've had this balance uh, or this, this balance goes back and forth between one going farther than the other. And when we first had arcade games, they were pretty much neck and neck with what we could play on the computer. And then the arcade pushed ahead and now the computer catches up. And now we have this, this, this fight of uh, graphics and sound trying to get better and better games out there. So it's really cool that they, you're at home and you're playing a game that's not in the arcade, but it really feels like the arcade. All right. So I almost said, let's put a coin in, but no, we're not putting a coin in. We're at home on the Apple II. So I'm going to plug in our paddle controls, like it said, and, okay, pushing the button on the paddle, and you can see I'm at the bottom of the screen controlling the paddle. Clicking the button on my paddle joystick. Sweet. Oh, that is really impressive looking. I don't think we've ever played an action game or a shooter game using paddle controls on on any system. Most of the time when we play paddle controls, it's, you know, a pong clone or a ball and paddle game. But this is pretty cool. This feels more like an arcade game using a paddle control to shoot. 
The controls are just left and right. It is fine-tuned for controls, but I don't see... What's the purpose of me shooting everything? If I don't shoot anything, does anything happen? Let's see. Oh, wait, something blew up. Does that mean... Oh, it did. Okay, so you must destroy them before they blow up like if they're bombs or mines. We didn't get a manual for this one, and we didn't also get a instructions before we started the game. So we're just winging it. We got this at the local computer shop, and we're checking it out for the first time in 1981. Most of the Apple II games don't have anything too impressive sound-wise, so they're... They're assailing our ears with sound, but I wouldn't call it good. I don't know if I'd prefer this to silence, though, because this feels more hectic, like we're flying in space trying to destroy everything. And now I understand it's star mines. They are the mines about to blow up. We must destroy them. Oh, here we go. Level two. Does it change it up? Whoa! It does warp us. Feels like I'm in 2001 A Space Odyssey. Looks just like they're coming faster. Oh, wait, is that death? It is, and they reset the score. Once they blow up, and that was it, that was game over. I guess I lost all the lives to continue. Well, we've been getting a little spoiled here on Chronologically Gaming, expecting multiple game modes, different screens, and so forth. And that would be as primarily in the arcades, because they're the ones pushing that. But we have seen it from home computer games as well that are doing the arcade game. So playing Star Mines and going to the next level and warping, and then it doesn't change the gameplay, feels a little stagnant, but that's going to be the use for a while. Okay, you see, we warp to the next level. They're just going to increase the difficulty just like an arcade game. But I believe that is it. Cool effect with the explosion at the end. And the warping was awesome. I love it. Okay, so for all the games we played up to this point, I couldn't push it any further than average. Uh, the sound kind of brings it down just a little bit, but it's not that big of a deal for the sound. It's more of the gameplay. It's the same repetitive monotonousness. But um, I, you know what? I'm going to bump it up. Above average for the paddle control, uh, three and a half stars for Star Mines. That was the most impressive or one of the most impressive things about that one. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. And the box in in intro uh, or the box art. Definitely. All right. So that was Star Mines for the Apple II. Let's see where we're going next. From one home computer to another, here's Stellar Escort for the TRS-80. Still trucking and... If it's by who I think it is, please, yes, it's by Big Five Software. So this is going to be really cool. This is one of the first releases that's not by Bill Hogue. And, um, oh, I can't remember his name at the top of my head. Yeah, so this one's by Jeff Zinn. The first time that Big Five Software had, <laughs> yeah, the, the first time they didn't have the original developers make a game. So this is Jeff Zinn's first for Big Five Software. And for Front of the Box, that actually is a really good representation of the game. A uh, art version of what we'll see on the TRS-80. All right, let's pop in and play Stellar Escort. Released at some point in 1981 for the Radio Shack TRS-80. Or the Tandy Radio Shack TRS-80. All right, so I bet I just type Stellar, right? Stellar Escort. So check it out. Bill Hogue, Jeff Conyu, Doss... Oh, they're the ones that designed the, uh, the loader program. Uh, so whenever we begin the game, it asks if you want to plug in a joystick. But I'm not controlling any of this. This is like the intro of the game. So I'm really hoping the joystick works for us. That we can play with the joystick on the TRS-80. Oh, and they have the voices! So cool. So this is by Jeff Zinn. Way to go, Jeff. We want instructions first, so we'll type I. Your mission, steer to avoid collision of escort and aliens, blast aliens to collect bounty, more fuel after destruction of all aliens, and they explain what all the blips and bloops are. Escort, cruncher, fent, grip, secker, boss, killer. <laughs> so they gave names to everybody. Can't say that I'm going to remember all of those by the time we're done, but we can control it with a keyboard, but we're going to use joystick for sure. So G to start. Here we go. One or two players. Let's do one player. 
Okay, so, so cool. Loving the voices. Okay, so I'm moving the ship around, and it, the joystick does work. I have a fire button, and it looks like it's just making the lasers appear right in front of me. I don't know if I'm supposed to be escorting these ships, but I am usually blowing everything up in 1981, so let's just blow everything up. Interesting perspective, because the the guns are coming from the sides on the corners, but whenever you, you're, you're, you can see your ship in front of you. So why have the ship showing here? It's just something we've never seen before. Cruncher point seven hundred. I really love the art style, the blown up pixels, the look of the TRS eighty. By this point, you could have had model three. Oh. oh. <laughs> And if you're seeing the artifacting, uh, that's what you see on some systems. It's... Oh, I love it. I can only fire one shot at a time. They're giving me the fuel gauge on the sign that I believe is just representative of the time, like we've seen with other games. What is this at the top? Oh, it's, it's so cool that they have a display a u uh, not a ui but it's it's displaying point score on the on the screen like overlaying everything else that is really impressive now i need to think back have we seen any game that has put text over the top of gameplay oh man there we go that's our explosion <laughs> yeah when we blew up something for a certain amount of points it showed us on the screen know about that one. Okay, got him. Nice. You can see enemies are coming in farther away. Like that one was, it, it gave a little wiggle. The little, uh, the dot that's coming in from behind or, or in front of us. So now I'm a little curious, what is the perspective they were going for? Oh gosh, because the perspective slightly feels... Uh oh, is that game over then? Am I dismissed? Yeah, so they give you the, the top score in the top left corner. And then, does it take over again? No, it goes back to the, the, the same game mode we had before. So I push G to play, and then one player to go. Yeah, this is a fantastic game to have in 1981 on your TRS-80, as most of the big five software games. We didn't get a manual for this one, or instructions on how to play. But it's, it's so cool having a controller you plug into the TRS-80 that just works and plays the game. Like an arcade yeah, game. So great. Yeah, the gameplay is what you see, what you get. We're not going to have any other game modes. I would say the most impressive Big Five software was when we played Battlezone, or the, a, a, a first-person shooter. And then if we play uh, games that are based on uh, arcade that they've made into uh, for the TRS-80. Incredible. You're up. This one. <laughs> and I love the voice modulation changes every time. So you're hearing something slightly different. <laughs> I just want to see the explosion again. You're dismissed. This one. <laughs> I wonder if that was the developer Jeff that did the voice. Because there's no other credits that I could find. It's just one person that did all the work for it. So cool. So that's Stellar Escort for the TRS-80. I love it. Uh, it is not the same game that you would be playing for other... Or not the, the typical game you'd see for the time. I'm still going to say just slightly above average. Three and a half stars. The voice talking and the controller support is awesome. Now, if we were basing this on just TRS-80, whoa, this would be way up there. Would be the other ones on Big Five Software, of one of the best games you could play for the TRS-80, definitely. For all the games, though, that you could play on a home computer, it is above average for sure. <laughs> oh, a three and a quarter? Yeah, we only do half half stars here, but yeah, if we, if we could do nuanced, then we would. All right, so that was Stellar Escort for the TRS-80. Let's see what's happening next. Yes! All right, excited about this one. This is Stellar Track for the Atari 2600.
Now, this one's a little different because Stellar Track is made or designed for the Sears telegames. Over 150 video games. And this is now what you would have seen. Almost all the video games you'd ever want to play. Introducing the Sears cartridge telegame system. Not the Over Atari. 150 video games, all on cartridges. This cartridge of 27 target games is included. But you can get more cartridges that have tank games, space war games, blackjack, speedway, over 150 video games so far. The Sears cartridge telegame system, sold only at Sears. Yeah, now when those came out, it was a cartridge that was a multi, like you put 27 games into one to play, and those are typical. We aren't really going to be covering a lot of compilation like they're showing here, unless it's games that you couldn't get anywhere else. So if, if we play a game, we want to make sure we cover everything, but if it's a compilation of everything we've already seen, then we're not, we're not going to play that one. So this is Stellar Track. This is one of the first games that we've played. I think there's only about four or five others that are branded just for Sears Telegames, and they're not by Atari. So this is Stellar Track, and this one's kind of a treat. It's a very different game than what you're expecting. Take a look at the box for Stellar Track, and you can see the brandings. Telegames is all over the place. Contains one cartridge. Still has cool artwork, just like Atari. And you can see where uh, this is a different game because it's not action, and is that... I was going to say it looks like the a Star Trek or Star Trek Enterprise, but no, it doesn't look quite like that. And if you flip it over on the back, it's really similar to Atari's. Stellar Track, using the joystick, they have the joystick symbol for you. Become the commander of your starship. Starfleet has assigned you the mission of destroying the alien warships. You can use your phasers and photon to fire on the enemy. You have limited star dates and limited energy to complete your mission. I'd really love to know if anyone got this and didn't know it was Atari, because if you saw in the commercial, this system by Sears looks exactly the same. So did you go home and tell your friends that you played on your Sears telegame system? I don't think so. Or I find it hard to believe. So for any other artwork we have for Stellar Track, we have alternate boxes. And then we also have the advertisement. Sears Exclusives, which is Steeplechase, another one we checked out. And uh, sadly, I was brandishing it as a uh, gambling uh, horse racing game. But no, it's more than that, a lot more than that. But this is Stellar Track. Use your scanners and galaxy maps to destroy the alien ships. Now, this one, the reason I say it's special is because uh, this one is a Star Trek, the genre variant. It's the same strategy Star Trek game that we saw on home computers, but done on the Atari. It's amazing. So the manual you can see is going to be really similar to what you'd see for an Atari manual, even though it's branded Sears all over the place. The History of Interstellar Conflict. And the original game was Star Trek, obviously, so this is totally rebranded and made just like a generic star space game. It's 2,000 years since the unification of our planet, and we, Terrans, have peacefully excelled in art, philosophy, and science. Our technology has mastered all but one problem, the hyperwarp drive, which will enable us to travel to other planets. So as time passes, we Terrans expand our empire through interstellar trade and the use of hyperwarp technology. The Who's the bad guys? Aliens are anxious to trade their hyperwarp technology with Terran art. Uh, while the Vice Wars are relaxing confident in our military superiority, the Alien Council of Elders rule that Terran culture has, be, has to be destroyed. This is to be done before alien dominance in the heavens is lost. So they're making it pretty generic. Instead of fighting Klingons or killing Klingons like in Star Trek, you're just fighting aliens. Now, like we said with the other Atari manuals, there's lots of lore. So if you want to get down deep and play the game and read the lore, you can through the manual. We do a little bit because it is... Uh, it is kind of bloated uh, for the, the the channel's purposes, but if you, you see what kind of game it is, it's a strategy game. And so this would be one of those games that you could really get lost in the manual te checking out the lore. So your mission objective is destroy the aliens in the galaxy with photons or phasers before they destroy you. If you run out of time, stardates, or fuel energy, we Terrans are lost. The complexity of Stellar Track will make it necessary for you to periodically refer to this manual during the first several missions. It's a good idea to use a notepad and pencil to keep track of vital information during your mission. So console controls, it uses the reset switch just like with any other game you play on the Atari. I don't know if I want to refer to it as the Sears Telegame, but um, like I've said before, we really don't hit on hardware. Like we're playing on a certain model of a certain computer. So the same with the console. This is still pretty much, the we're playing on the Atari VCS. All right, so you have the different skill level switches and what they do. And then does it have anything for the black and white? 
I don't think so. No, nothing on here. So when you use the joystick, all you do with the joystick is you're selecting commands because it's meant to be used to type in commands on a keyboard. But they've made this so you can play it with the joystick, the Atari joystick. That's what the that's what's the most impressive thing about this. It's a strategy game played with the Atari joystick. So you can move left and right to select what command you want, and you just push the red button for what you want. And it explains what the long-range sensors do, short-range sensors, and warp. And then it, it breaks down on the screen what you see and what, the, uh, what, what that means. It's the same game we played in the past, which is the Star Trek strategy game. And I'm going to refer back to the manual if we need to, but uh, we'll just start playing. Let's pop in Stellar Track and play at some point in 1981 by Atari, published by Sears. For the Sears Telegame console. So the game begins with Starfleet to Starship Commander. Your mission is to destroy 19 alien warships in 22 star dates. And all I do is I push the red button and then it says what kind of command do you want. And all you have to do is move left and right on your joystick and say what you want. Now I feel bad for the kid that got this when it came out. This is a lot of ones that you would find in a bargain bin because Stellar Track is a game that you think is something action, like you're gonna play Missile Command or something really cool on the Atari, but you don't. When you get this, the poor kid that was probably eight years old was really disappointed and dropped this in a heartbeat. So I can see this not selling a lot of copies or not doing very well because it's a letdown when you realize that you're not shooting things. Or at least, you know, directly. So what kind of commander do we want? We can look at the galaxy map. And if I look at the galaxy map, it's what we've seen before. It has a grid. I think the manual explains how many quadrants and sectors we have. So we're in quadrant 3-2, sector 4-4. Four, four. It's a three-dimensional grid, if you've ever seen the, the other games we played on the, the Star Trek variant. But uh, that's how you look at it. And then it says, what command do you want next? And we can do like a long-range scan. And then it'll say, what's here? So we got three, uh, so in three, two, se so we're in sector three, two, four, four, and it shows what's uh, displayed. I think if we look at the manual, it'll tell us what those are. So you, you do have to know what the numbers mean whenever you do a long range scan. So if we check out the mission commands, it tells you all the different commands here. The galaxy map is, there you go, a six by six chart, 36 quadrants. And scan quadrant shows two digit number of the galaxy map. The left digit indicates the number of aliens in that quadrant. The right tells you whether a star base exists in the quadrant. So if they show you like long range sensor scans and they give you an example of the screen, you are here in the center of quadrant four, four and the numbers on the screen mean what? If you use the short range scan to find exactly where the enemy is. So you use long range scan to find out where to go. And then once you get there, then you use the short range scan to show you what's in that quadrant. And let's see, we would want to go to, if we're in the center of quadrant four, four, and we would want to go to the outside, we want to tell, we, we want to warp to a uh, different location. So again, it's, it's kind of cumbersome because it's a strategy game, but it's being done on a one joystick, one button control uh, joystick. It's, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> All right, so it looks like we had a uh, we hit an alien. Our command is short range scan. So you can see now we're they they have a different scan for our our, our ships, and we have uh, one enemy in the top right. So now let's do status. Can we do red alert? Because I know we could on the computer. Let's see, we want warp phasers. Let's try photon. Photon course. We want. One, two, we want one. And you can see it fired the photon just north, but it missed it because the ship is a little to the right of that. Okay, so let's go back to phasers. And then it's just how powerful you want to shoot the phasers. Let's do 300. Oh, uh, three, zero, zero. Boom, and blew him out of the sky. Alien destroyed. And that's how the action goes in the strategy game. And then the alien is destroyed, and now we can go back to the galaxy map. And then from here, well, let's do a warp. Let's see what the warp looks like. Warp course seven. Oh yeah, which course do we want? Let's do course two. And then factor five, engage. And we're here. So now we do another short range scan. This is what we got now. We got a ship uh, enemy just down to the bottom left of us. So our ship obviously looks like the Enterprise. It's at the top of the screen. And you notice how the screen is kind of cr crushed in? It's because when they programmed uh, games like this uh, for the uh, VCS, you couldn't sometimes fill the whole screen up. 
because of limitations of the the hardware. <laughs> yeah, right? Oh, so we must be already red alert um, because we were in, in range. And it didn't give me the option. So maybe the game's doing it automatically on, on this one for the, for the VCS. Okay, so let's do attack. Let's do another phasers. And let's just do only 200 units this time. Blew them out of the water. Alien destroyed. And that's how the game works. You move from sector to sector, scanning, finding where the enemies are, and then des destroying the enemies. And you can see now we're not red because we're not in red alert. There's no enemies around. When we played this on the computer, you had to select that. It was more in kind to playing a Star Trek game. It made you feel like you were Captain Kirk, because at this point you would be Captain Kirk. You're in control of the entire starship and everything that's involved. And that was the big draw to the game. You have control over so much more than just moving um, a ship around like in Gal uh, Space Invaders or Galaxian. You're able to uh, manage other things in involving the, the whole Enterprise. And this one is that same thing, same thing. Kind of slimmed down just a little bit for the VCS, but still works really well. So Stellar Track is a treat if you wanted to play strategy. But this, I'm sure, annoyed lots of people. If I was eight years old and I got this expecting to play Missile Command or another shooter like Space Invaders and it's not that, you, you, you would be very disappointed. So I can't say that it's the, the average. It is a, it is a amazing attempt to put on the system and it does well for a strategy game. So I'm gonna say three and a half stars considering every other game we've seen to this point. It's, it's a well-programmed and a, a good time with a strategy uh, game in mind. Oh yeah, totally can see that too. Two and a half, I, I, I'm with you. All right, so with that, let's press forward and see our next game. From Radio Shack, all right, this is Strange Odyssey. Proof that we're really not playing all of Scott Adams' games in order. This is adventure number six of his series of adventure titles. Strange Odyssey is number six, so I believe we've seen, I think 12 is the, the, the highest one we've seen so far. Let's take a look at the box for Strange Odyssey. <laughs> Going back to that classic, you know, computer... Let's just make it ourselves front of the front of the box. An uncharted planetoid in the depths of space is your ticket to the treasures of a far-flung alien empire. What is going on with the front though? Is that a space bull firing lasers from its mouth? <laughs> Did Scott Adams do this himself? I just picture him painting something like uh, Bob Ross. Dare to try another adventure? So you can see if we flip this over to the back, it would be up to adventure nine that you could play. Recommended for the novice adventure, but built in many built in helps. Ask for your dealer. And here's an advertising flyer for Strange Odyssey, Scott Adams' newest adventure. Marooned at the edge of the galaxy, you come across the ruins of ancient alien civilization, complete with fabulous treasures and alien technologies. Can you collect the treasures and escape, or will you be forever marooned? So it's that usual let's play, go get treasures, come back in a text adventure game or formula. And there's our cartridge, or not cartridge, our cassette we'll be playing on. Adventure number six. All right, let's pop it and play Strange Odyssey, released at some point in 1981 by Scott Adams. And yes, we have. You can check it out in the link down below for the list of everything and see the count if you want. So this one is Adventure 6. So we load this up just typing ADV and then number six to go in. What is your name? You know what? Let's make it... Chip tune tonight. 15 seconds, please. I know they use your name at some point in the game. Do we want to store a previously saved game? Oh, wait, it's got to always be caps. No, we don't. And as usual, the program will allow you to have an adventure without ever leaving your armchair. You can look at, pick up, manipulate objects you find there. This is like every other adventure game by Scott Adams at the time. Two word text parser. And don't copy that floppy. Welcome to adventure number six Strange Odyssey by Scott Adams. Dedicated to the Novaks. I'm in a one-man scout ship. Visible items are control console, closed door. Look, console. Blue button marked blast off and an unmarked red button. Can we push the red button? Push red? Okay, we did. Oh, nothing happens if we push the red button? Oh, I thought we'd blow up or die or something. We're very exceptional at dying at text adventure games here on Chronologically Gaming. Look again. Does it reset the top? No, it doesn't. Uh, the it, Scott Adams Adventure Games split the screen into two parts, so you can always see what you're looking at. We've had some other ones that uh, just continue to scroll up, so you don't really know what's happening unless you you know memorize it. Okay, so let's go. Uh, exits are down. Let's go down. Oh, we have an open door though. I guess that's how we go down. So we're in a storage hold. Visual items are maintenance, access hatch, spacesuit, phaser, and shovel. Get suit. Got it. Get 
phaser. Did I spell it right? Got it. Get shovel. Got them all. And then we just go back up, I guess. Yeah, now we're back up. I really like the simplicity, though, when you don't need to type the whole word north or the whole word up and down. Because we've seen some text adventure games that you have to type the whole word up and down. It gets really cumbersome. All right. Uh, door. I don't know how to door something. Open door. How? What do you mean how? Okay, then push. Red. Oh, go door. I should have known. <laughs> this time I got to walk through because uh, many, many times we've been locked out or the code didn't work to play the game and all the adventure games don't work so well. I'm in a small airlock, but it's visible items are the red button by the door, closed outer door, and open inner door. So you can see this is a sci-fi themed game, text adventure game, and the idea is you want to go get gather treasures and bring them back. <laughs> yes, whenever you type it wrong and then you realize it's messed up, gosh, it used to frustrate me so much. All right, so we're going to stop this one here for the TRS-80, and as usual, these are about average for the time. We're going to do three stars for Strange Odyssey, but that's not all. We're also going to play Strange Odyssey for the PC or IBM. This is Strange Odyssey for PC booter or whatever you could play it at, at the time. So starting with the front of the box, it looks pretty much the same as what we saw before, but we now have the back of the box with full lore of the, the, the whole story. Every adventure game by Scott Adams has the full story. This one says it's uh, 12 to adult to play this one. So more adult than the other ones. I think the other ones were eight years old to play. If you run a small business. All right, and let's go. We're playing some Strange Odyssey for the IBM at some point in 1981. Adventure number six. So we can go down and get that space suit. Oh, that's right. It doesn't understand space. You have to do one word. Get suit. Get f phaser. Get shovel. There we go. And then go back up. And look, console. Blue button marked blast off. Let's push. Now, you know what? We are on the PC, so probably if I die and blast off, the game might crash. Just, just a heads up. So push blue. Warning light says power crystal damage. Nothing happens. Oh, because we have to go fix it first. So push red. We push red and then go door. And now the door is open and we're past the next next screen. And then now we can, I think we can, oh, we're going to be going outside into space or space, I think. So we have to wear suit, put the suit on, and then push red. And then now the outer door is open. The inner door is, so we open the door. Now, most likely if we didn't put the suit on, we'd die. So you have to make sure you do that first. All right, so then now we go door. And we're out outside the airlock on a ledge. The ground below is 90 meters away. Okay, so obvious exits are none. So we can just go anywhere. So let's go north. I can't go in that direction. Go. Oh, we have to jump. Okay, the gravity here is very weak. We're out in the middle of nowhere. Can we go north now? Okay, we went north. I'm on a small planetoid. And so now you have to know which way to go. And oh my gosh. So if you were playing this 1981, you'd be making a map of all the directions you need to go. At this point, this is another one of those times we've seen in text adventure games where you have to be making a map. So I'm looking at a walkthrough to explain you know where to go and which direction to, to, to play in. But you would have to do trial and error, trying different things over and over again, which we've done on the channel. We didn't know what we were doing. We just, we just jump in and play a text adventure game from 1981. But back then, you'd be having to make the map to know exactly where to go next. <laughs> yes, it's not a planet. It's a smaller one. It's a planetoid. All right, so that was Strange Odyssey for MS-DOS. For the games we played again, it'll be three stars. A perfectly average text adventure game. And last but not least, this is Strange Odyssey for the Atari home computer. Which is slightly different, believe it or not. This one, it has two different boxes, one for the cassette tape and then one for the disc. So the disc looks like the ones we saw on the TRS-80 and on PC, but this one is for the tape, which looks a little higher quality. What in the world's going on? I think you're picking up an alien that's puking all over you. <laughs> that's supposed to be you as the astronaut. 
So it does look a little classier from this front of the box compared to this one, but flipping over in the back is the same. It also explains on the left side all the different things you might need, like special equipment, how much real time, or if it's a real time game or not, if it's graphics oriented. I really like that when they show, show you details of the game before you buy it. So it's 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 good for the consumer that was out there in 1981, making sure they're making a, a, a good purchase of the video games. So yeah, two different bo 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 uh, back of the boxes, but they're about the same. And then a different ad for Strange Odyssey, the universe beckons. Your spaceships crashed on an uncharted planet and you have to explore a planetoid. Explore the exciting dimensions of deep space. Step through that shimmering curtain of light that spans the universe. On, yeah. Come on. These days it's my Atari home computer. All right, so this is we're on the Atari. We have, uh, uh, we're gonna boot off a uh, disc for this version because it's gonna go a little bit faster for us. But at some point in 1981, we got Strange Odyssey. Adventure number six by Scott Adams. If you don't like Scott Adams, you probably don't like our show because we played, I think, 30 or so games by Scott Adams so far. Do we want to restore a previously saved game? No, we do not. We want to play some text adventure games. I'll be your puppet in the adventure, so only give me two word English sentences. And please don't copy or accept a pirated copy. Let's go. Welcome to adventure number six, Strange Odyssey. Sounds familiar. Feels like it's Groundhog Day here. <laughs> Maybe Scott Adams does because he convinced his wife to program one of these text adventure games. And I know my wife's watching right now, so imagine if I told you to do a show about playing video games. I don't think you'd be down for it. But he, his wife was. She made a whole text adventure game. So what do we want to do? We want to go down. And then we want to get suit. Yes, get phaser. We're getting good at this. And get shovel. We're going to dig something up. We want to get a treasure this time. we got to get a treasure. And we go back up. Let's push red. Didn't even need to look at the console, but it works. And then now the door is open, so go door. Which, by the way, should be the theme of text adventure games. Because since the beginning of the first graphic adventure game, that was the one that stuck, uh, made it difficult for us to play. Go door should be every text adventure game. At least the two word text parser ones. I'm in a small airlock. So now we wear suit and then push red. I know I'd die if I didn't do it that way. So whoosh, the door's open, outer door's ready. Now go, go door. That's what you gotta do. I'm outside the airlock on a ledge. So now we jump off the ledge, which you have to know that verb. If I didn't know the verb to jump, like we played another one by Jim Pearson, a text adventure game. We're in hell and we're on a cliff ledge. I didn't know we had to use the word jump. I'm on a small planetoid. Okay, so now we want to make sure we go to the right place. So now we go north and north again. And now we have a cave. So what do we do? We say go cave because that's what you do in a text adventure game. Go cave. I'm in a large cavern and we have a large, uh, we have a boulder that's in front of us. Now this means we have to use our phaser. So if I look at my inventory or is it just I? There we go. So eyes inventory. We have the spacesuit, the phaser, and the shovel. So since we have the, the phaser, you have to know to say shoot boulder. I fire the phaser. Nothing happens. Either I missed or the beam was absorbed without visible effect. Okay, so do it again. Shoot boulder. Oh, so the beam missed. Why? Wait a second, so the walkthrough I'm following says I should just have to fire the phaser and then boom, boulder works. Okay, what about look, go light? I don't think we have a light, right? Yeah, I can't do that yet. That's the next one. So that means we have to do something with our phaser, but I'm not sure. We're already puzzled by the puzzle. We have the phaser and the shovel. Shoot, maybe just do it again. No, shoot. Oh, shoot. Still, nothing happens. Um, fire boulder. I must be stupid if I don't understand what you mean. Yes, you don't understand me. You don't understand me because you're a computer. Okay, try it. Push. Boulder. Thank you, chat. That is what I'm talking about. I think text adventure games are the best interactive gameplay because I can't put a joystick in your hand, but you can tell me what to type because that's what we always did with text adventure games back home. <laughs> Punching the boulder. Every time we try this, it doesn't understand. Punch, yeah. 
You don't know how to punch something. Screw you. I don't know what you is. <gasps> they don't know who we are. I was expecting to say I don't know how to screw something because we have seen that and it might happen again. Okay, there we go. Help. And <laughs> it says, okay, how? That's not helpful. What about hint? I don't know how to hint something. We've seen some text adventure games where they tell us the hint, but it looks like not this one. Oh, too bad. So let's do it again. Shoot boulder. Now in the large cavern and the visual items are large boulder. Nothing happens. The beam was absorbed without visible effect. Okay, uh, go boulder. I found nothing. I slide back down. What? Okay. So, okay, uh, that means I went up the boulder. Go boulder means climb the boulder, I guess. Because if, what if I try climb, it doesn't understand. Oh, no, it does. Okay, it, it got climb. Way to go, Scott Adams. Go light is the next one. So, uh, essentially, you're going to be firing a laser, blow the boulder up, and then you go inside. But uh, like we usually do with text adventure games, or adventure games in general, we're just doing a little taste of what it feels like to play a text adventure game. The frustration. The difficulty. Can you get the computer to understand you? That's pretty much what we did tonight. And as usual with the other ones we played, it's a three-star game, a perfectly average game, for considering all the ones we played at this point. All right, so that was Strange Odyssey. It is not the last we've seen of Scott Adams. We'll see him again. Let's press forward and see our next game. Yes, after all the computer playing at home, we're back in the arcades, and this is Strategy X. Let's check out Strategy X, starting with the advertising flyer. Oh, it's Konami. And this is one of the peak games of Konami from 1981, where they're starting to get in their stride. This means we're going to Japan to play some Strategy X. You can see from the front of the uh, advertising flyer, Konami isn't following like a normal formula we've seen with Taito. They kind of change it up, but it is all in Japanese. They're explaining all the different things you can shoot at and a really tiny picture of the screenshot there. And we also have another one because when it came to other regions, it was done by Stern. Stern Electronics presents the greatest war game of all, Strategy X. And you'll see why. It's pretty cool. Strategy X, it'll blow your mind. And they have some uh, examples of the arcade cabinet, which is kind of interesting. And it's the back of the advertising flyer. That's pretty cool uh, for the front of the advertising flyer. But flip it over in the back. It shows a, a zoomed in view of the, uh, the arcade cabinet with controls. And then a few instructions. Does it say? Yeah, it explains the levels. You defend yourself against rotating cannons. Second level, watch out for attacking jeeps. Third level comes attacking shooting tanks. Fourth level is rotating cannons again, but this time against moving background. So they're, t they're letting you know there's more than one thing you'll see with this game. And there's the example of the arcade cabinet for Strategy X. In North America, I'd love to see what it was in Japan because I've been told it's more colorful. This one looks more like a war game that you're going to play. And there's the arcade controls. It's a four-way joystick with uh, two buttons to rotate. And then you use the button on the top of the joystick to fire, which is so cool. So instead of um, uh, 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 whenever you control your tank, you move that around with a joystick, but then you rotate with the buttons. It's the turret that's on top of your tank. And then you fire it with the joystick. Yeah, there you go. This, this uh, kind of a uh, confusing way to say it. Oh, sorry. Eight-way joystick, not four-way joystick. And there's our arcade marquee for Strategy X. Oh, yeah. Really excited to go to Japan for this one. Now, we have two different versions, the one in Japan and the one in, by Stern. We're going to Japan and playing some Strategy X released at some point in 1981 by Konami. Oh, man. Konami in 1981. Here we go. So first things first, this game is broken into two sections, like we've seen with Rally X and Defender. Now, instead of a radar, though, they're just displaying fuel and high score on the left side. The game, though, is a vertically scrolling shooter where you're in control of like a futuristic tank that's scrolling up on the top of the screen. And there's no sound because we're seeing this in a track mode, but um, taking a shooter game that is scrolling up vertically and it's it's progressing and giving you more and more level to see is very reminiscent to something like scramble or super cobra instead of scrolling horizontally and you go to different levels this one is like you're on the ground and you're uh be, being able to penetrate enemy defenses and fortress and stuff so forth all right so this was the full artwork you see around the outside for stern electronics and we can see a zoomed in view i want to i don't have the one for japan sadly so we're going to go in here and now put a coin in here we go.
go ahead. And what's awesome is you're able to scroll over the arrow. Love that. But do you see the turret controls on top? My fuel is constantly running out whether I move forward or not. So it's another fuel is just used as the time. And then we have different things to avoid like TNT. But we can blow up the walls. And destroy the turrets. Can we blow up the TNT? Yes. Nice. You kind of expect the TNT to be a red barrel because that's what it usually is. And then that on the left side, that's a mine. Oh man, one of a, one, they, they got me. They got me, Sarge. I also get to fire off two bullets at once. So when you're pushing down that joystick on the control panel, it fires twice, like uh, in, in rapid succession. And I do need some fuel over here. These turrets can blow the fuel up. So what you do is you just move in, wait here a sec, and then fuel fills, fills you up a little bit, and then you move on to the next one. Oh, I see the walls got me. Okay, so if you, if you <laughs> your tank isn't very powerful on those walls, apparently. And notice what it's done. It saved it. So this is another game that we can just keep going. If you have enough money, you can just keep playing it and get further and further. All right, let's see if we can get fuel. Go, don't hit the TNT. So we got a little bit more. Gives us, give us points for that. And then we have another fuel up here. Yeah, there we go. Now this is a game you would want to play using the control panel or an arcade uh, ar arcade control panel or play it in the arcades go, go check out this because uh, i've able to, been, been able to play this in the arcades using this joystick so i'm familiar with it so i got something close but it's so cool being able to move yourself and the turret at the same time reminiscent of something we played with like a four-way or a twin stick shooter kind of thing all right we need to get more fuel or we're going to die the big thing this game has for it is let's keep moving up and let's see what's next. <laughs> I hit the wall again. I don't think I'm a tank. I can't be a tank. So uh, let's put some more money in and go. Does it save it? Because I know our score is gone, but do can we keep going? It does not. So at least it didn't let us continue. Maybe I was supposed to hit something different to continue, but, but <laughs> I did it again. I'm hitting the walls. Terrible. Yeah, we're going to get another one next year that is totally like Commando. Because this one's still in a tank. You're still in a vehicle, but there's another one we're going to see next year that's really close to Commando. Probably shouldn't be blowing up the fuel. I feel like I'm playing River Raid, and i got to be careful. And over on the side, there must be water. Gotta shoot my way through here. Grab some of the fuel before they blow it up, quick. Thank you, get going. <laughs> Those turrets are a terrible shot. I'm glad they are. <laughs> okay, wish to continue. Push the discharge button. So I believe it is resetting, unless I'm the one pushing, I think because I'm pushing player one start. Let's see if we can do where I push the attack button. Because it said discharge button, maybe that means the, the shot. <laughs> I've never heard the, the fire button referred to as the discharge button. Okay, moving around, don't hit the TNT. Gotta get that fuel. Nice, looking good. Move to the top. Oh, and they got me that time. <laughs> yeah, you can see the scroll doesn't force yourself ahead. So I can even move freely. I'm just gonna run out of fuel. And whether I'm moving or not, you can see the fuel just keeps going down. So it's kind of like a timer, not really. Well, maybe I guess it takes fuel to run the thing, but it doesn't go down faster when I shoot and it doesn't go down faster when I move. So it's, it's pretty much just a timer. But yeah, I can, I'm not forced to move up. I have freedom. I'm not automatically scrolling. It's not forcing me to scroll. It's the wave of the future. Yes, I was talking about Frontline, that's right. We got 1982 so locked down with so many games in order 
that I'm pretty sure if people are familiar with the release date or they were excited for a game to show up, you're going to see it on the when you, when you expect it. There we go. Let's get on the side over here. Oh, yes. Now, this is kind of... When you first see those, you think it's, it's walls that you can't touch. But no, they're okay. It's just the mines you can't touch. Okay, we're going to the next level. The base is 300 kilometers off. Oh, dang it. I blew the fuel up. It's River Raid all over again. So now we got fast-moving tanks. Awesome. Love it. So discharge button. Does it save it? So this time, oh, it worked. Okay, this time I pushed fire, which I guess is the discharge button, instead of one player, because one player will restart you from the beginning. But now, if you got enough money, you can just keep going. Don't hit me. Okay, I'm going to need a little bit of fuel. There we go. Sideswipe that guy. Let's get this fuel here. So if you're a good enough player with this game, if you can keep refueling then you just keep going so i can see on the harder difficulties when this the game resets and plays over and over again that you can just keep going if you were really good there we go looking nice let's see if we can get this fuel here no we'll risk it <laughs> but it doesn't matter we got all the money in the world here in japan in the arcades Our parents gave us several hundred yen to play this. No, go. Yes, good. There we go. I really enjoy the destructible environments. Kind of like we saw with spiders. They, the spiders are building a web and you can destroy them. So cool. And L. Curtis B., if you're still on, the game you showed me that we'll, we will be playing eventually in 1981 with the dis destructible asteroids, awesome. Yeah, I'm excited to show that one too. All right, so we should do fire and put some more coins in and let's go. What we're experiencing too is the levels are the same every time. So whenever we play from the beginning again, like when I push start, oh man. Okay, so the TNT has range. You can't blow it up that close. <laughs> yes, this is where all the yen coins went. <laughs> so even though the explosion of the TNT is small, it actually has a wider range. Oh, and the water actually blows me up too. All right, let's get away from the mine, get some fuel. There we go, love it. There we go. All right, we got n new enemies. Moving shooting tanks. Awesome. Now, does this mean they can blow up the, the walls too? Let's see if they can. They can't. <laughs> so I can just stay here. <laughs> they can blow up into the walls. That's, that's great. No, I can't believe it. On the left side, it's now calling this part three, and I believe it said there were four parts to the game. Oh, that's just terrible. Just terrible. Yes, let's go, let's go. Do not push player one, or you start over at the very beginning. This means if someone ran out of money, so we're in Japan, I'm playing the game, and I didn't have enough yen to put in, and um, the next person that steps up, if it goes to the countdown, they could just push the button and take over where the person left off. If they have the cash. All right, they're giving me less fuel. Yeah, I, I, I know what they're doing. We've seen this before. And I, I just shot another fuel. That's not helpful. Yeah, not looking good. Yep, died. <laughs> we blow up and we don't have enough fuel. <laughs> Tanks of the future. All right, gotta keep moving. Keep moving. Miss the mines. They <laughs> blew the fuel up again. You can use the TNT to your advantage, though. Blowing everybody up, uh, that, uh, up around that vicinity works. I oh, love that. The enemies can die on the mines, too. And the enemies can shoot themselves.
Ooh, that's close. Now we're gonna get the fuel. Going back. Alright, so obviously you can tell by the gameplay that this game is loads of fun for 1981. And something that is wanting me to continue to play and not stop playing. Just go, go. Let's see what's next. Nope, don't blow up the fuel. Oh, see, that's tricky. You could have died because the walls kill you. Let's see if we can sneak by. There we go. Blow your own hole through and go. And this means we're on part four, which is the boss? Oh, it's 100 kilometers away. Oh, now they got water that moves in? Nice. <laughs> so the water makes it just a little slick. But I was right there by the fuel. Oh, if it is, I didn't notice. I need to remember that. If, it, if it, the range is bigger, blow it up and uh, hopefully kill some more enemies on. So, clever programming. If you notice the level before, the tanks that were moving and shooting, the turrets were not shooting. Oh, this is slippery. Watch out. Give me some of that fuel. Need that fuel. But now that we're in this level without tanks that are moving and shooting, now the turrets are shooting freely. So very clever. I saw what you did there. Alright, so this is fantastic. I just want to keep going and keep going. Even when we make it to the base, I want to keep playing because it plays so well and so much fun. This is definitely the very best game Konami's ever done that we've ever seen. And for all the games we played up to this point, it is one of the best video games you could play. I'm going to go all five. It's five stars for Strategy X. So many, on, works on so many fronts. All right, and with that, we are putting our video game playing on pause. That is it for this evening, and like I always say, Scott Adams is the adventure game king. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9 p.m. Central, so join us and let us know if we miss any games along the way. This video would not be possible without RetroArch and LaunchBox. Please tell your friends there's some crazy guy out there trying to play every single video game. You can always check out Chronologically Gaming on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We will catch you next time.